So good evening, everyone. Um, thank you so much for joining us for tonight's art talk. I'm Nancy Stokes, curator at Kimball Arts Center, and we are thrilled to have two of Catalina uh, Oyoung's powerful sculptures as part of our current exhibition, Wonderland, at the Kimball Arts Center. And tonight we have the wonderful opportunity to connect with the artist. So um, thank you very much. Tonight's talk takes the form of a conversation between Catalina and Jane Ursula Harris. And before they begin, I just wanted to take a moment to introduce them both. Catalina Oyoung engages object making, interdisciplinary environments and time-based projects to indicate counter narratives around representation and self-definition. Through expansion, fragmentation, and abstraction, we propose the body as a politicized landscape that is subject to partition. Working with materials ranging from hand-carved wood and stone to appropriated liter literature and historic artifacts, they attend to a critical reimagining of historical formation, wherein monstrosity, animal animality, and toxicity act as ciphers for the alienation of the minor subject. Jane Ursula Harris is a Brooklyn-based writer whose essays have appeared in numerous catalogs, um, most recently in Carnegie Mellon's and ICA Miller's Jacoby Satterwhite, Spirits Roaming on the Earth from 2021, and has also contributed to Art Forum, Art in America, Book Forum, Bomb, Cultured Magazine, The Paris Review, Flash Art, Freeze, Believer, Garage, and The Village Voice, among others. And she curates on a freelance basis and is an art history faculty member at the School of Visual Arts. When Catalina and Jane are done this evening, we really want to invite all of you to participate in this conversation. So please definitely make note of your questions and hold on to them. And we look forward to getting as many of them, getting to many, uh, as many of them as possible. Uh, and with that, uh, thank you so much and uh, take it away. Thank you for, um, spending this evening with us. Okay, so I just want to say hi and thank you to everybody um, who's here. And, um, you know, just to kind of contextualize this work, because obviously, you know, we're here on the occasion of this exhibition, Wonderland, um, and Nancy already kind of uh, read a few things related to that. You know, one of the uh, kind of quotes, which I think is actually uh, from Catalina, is this idea of counter narratives around representation and self-definition. Um, <clears throat> and I wanted to just lay out a few themes uh, to kind of contextualize the works in this exhibition, you know, so that we have a sense of, you know, Catalina's larger practice, um, which I, you know, hopefully everybody is here to learn about as well. And so, you know, this idea of counter narratives around representation and self-definition, when I um, wrote a, uh, a feature, I, I do this column at Flash Art called One to Watch, and Catalina was the first one that I wrote about. Um, it was titled Perilous Embodiment. And um, one of the things that was interesting was, you know, this kind of relationship to the body as something unruly, as something mythic, abject, unknowable, but rife with associations, right? So there's a lot of visceral qualities in, in the work. Uh, but this idea of, you know, dismantling, and this is a quote again from Catalina that I used in, in my um, piece, where um, they talked about dismantling or rejecting an expectation of performing and upholding any one identitarian position. So that's sort of echoing what Nancy, you know, this idea of counter narratives, right? Um, to kind of simplify that, one could say it's, it's, you know, a kind of rejection of fixed notions of identity. And that isn't necessarily anything new. I think, you know, lots of artists have been doing that in, in different contexts. Uh, but I think that Catalina's approach is, is very intriguing. Um, this idea of monstrosity, I think we can connect to the idea of the grotesque and, um, you know, the way that that relates again to the body, to the unruly body. But also I think in Catalina's work to loss, to grief, to rage, you know, you'll see that there are themes of revenge and retribution 
in the work. And there's also a lot of hybridity. And I'm going to just um, get us going, I think, with the uh, PowerPoint. So at least you have something to look at while I talk. And I won't be talking for too much longer. Don't worry. Uh, but I'm going to just get this started. Hopefully everyone can see that. Nancy, yes? Yes. Catalina, yes? Okay, cool. So, um, you know, at least you have something to look at here, right? But, you know, there's a lot of uh, hybridity in the work, and that's both represented in, you know, a lot of kind of animal human composites in the figuration, but it's also in, in the um, suturing of language. Um, and there's a lot of literature, whether it's prose, poetry, theory, that um, Catalina uses and references. It's in her titles. It's in often the, the work itself. Um, so that suturing with language, that suturing of the animal and the human, um, that suturing of the personal and the political and the mythic because we'll also see lots of references to mythology. That's all, I think, a part of her strategy. And this engagement with, you know, contingencies of being outside of logic and moral, uh, morals rather. So, you know, there's feral qualities, there's visceral qualities. There's still also a lot of, you know, uh, of intellectual and deeply analytical um, thinking going on in the work. Um, so what else? Um, you know, just to mention to materials, because I also think that's something incredibly fascinating um, is the symbolic use of materials um, in Catalina's work. And, you know, they range from um, lotus roots and pickled eggs and chain mail and oyster shells um, to, you know, puppy skulls, horse skulls, um, wolf skulls. Um, as well as more traditional things, you know, like wood and clay and fabric, um, marble, et cetera. So I think hopefully that's a kind of suturing in a, in a kind of, um, you know, way that honors Catalina's approach of various themes and ideas, I think, that are going on in the work. Um, and, you know, this idea of monstrosity as agency and the taboo as as revelatory and ideas of sanity and, um, you know, what's crazy and what's not, especially for femme and female identified subjects um, is also, I think, really fascinating part of the work. So um, I think I'll leave it there and then we'll just move on to, um, we'll come back to this work and talk about this. But we'll, we'll start with, I wanted to start with Reliquary of Janus because this is the first work that I saw of Catalina's. It was part of an incredible exhibition that really should have gotten more attention at the Sculpture Center. And, you know, I think it was just too complex for a lot, you know, your kind of basic, uh, I don't know. I, I won't say too much about, you know, the art world publishing because I'm a part of it, but it, it was an incredibly interesting show. And it took place, if you've ever been to the Sculpture Center in the basement, which is this very subterranean medieval uh, kind of environment you can see here, right, with these arched doorways, these low ceilings, these brick walls. So I was just transfixed by this work. And this, by the way, has, you know, a gray wolf skull and it's called Reliquary Janus. And there's, you know, horse hair, I believe, and these other materials. And here you can see this idea of the grotesque and the ceremonial and the shamanistic. Um, so I, and there's a fur trap in here. So there's also the subtext of torture and it, it takes place in a larger context of an installation. Catalina's work is so, um, she's so incredibly prolific and I don't know, I, I'm just always in awe of how much she produces and how much she thinks. We both have really kind of dense and complex brains, I think. Um, but also there's a lot of this, you know, feral and, and primeval qualities that drew me to this piece. So there's this fetish-like quality and I'm just gonna go, you know, to show you this slide because 
in addition to that incredible sculpture, there are these videos that are, um, one is Joan of Arc by um, Theodore Dreyer, Carl Theodore Dreyer, you know, that 1926 film, or 28, excuse me, and then The Virgin's Bed by Philippe Garrel. So there are these segments, and, and Catalina, I'm going to turn it over to you, I promise, in a second, that play, but that kind of evoke subjugation and desire. You know, The Virgin's Bed is, you know, there, there, there's these aspects going on. And there's audio in coming from the uh, floor of um, the artist in her uh, their mother discussing poems by this contemporary poet, Anne Boyer. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Catalina, who will hopefully, um, you know, just talk about this work, how it came to be, and, um, you know, maybe even the, the idea of the Janus, right, which is, of course, this Roman figure um, who is the kind of symbol of, of, of thresholds of doors, of, you know, being able to see the past and the future, the two faces. Um, I don't know if that's what you were thinking about, though. Catalina, you want to maybe yeah. do this? Yeah. Yeah, thank you, Jane, um, for that really wonderful overview and introduction. Uh, just to everyone, <laughs> I have my video off uh, just to make my audio a little smoother. Um, so yeah, uh, this installation at the Sculpture Center um, is titled Common Burn. Um, actually, you know, uh, I was thinking about the the Mazzy Star song, which is, it's a love song. Um, but, you know, it, it was a project that, that grew really out of a specific moment in time. And for, for some time, I had uh, sort of resisted making work that, you know, was clearly like born out of a specific time period in, in my life or certain events going on in the world, right? Because I was like uh, reaching for some kind of like quality of like timelessness, right? Or, um, but uh, so I began um, a version of this project in June uh, 2020. So it was like in the middle of uh, lockdown and all of the George Floyd pro protests were, were happening. And so I was thinking about burning fire, right? It was was like so um, rife and, and prevalent in, in the air and it, on the news um, and on social media, you know, and I was thinking about fire as a language um, and fire as a mode of both cleansing and destruction and you know rebirth with the phoenix like i i'm always sort of taking things back to um like uh mythic reference um which you know i can talk right. about more later um and uh so i so i was working on the so um all all these images of like things burning um you know it's like an interesting um almost form of like propaganda, right? Like for the media to sort of almost demonize, right? Like the protesters, like, look at them like looting, you know? And and mm -hmm. it made me think about like um, images from a very different kind of fire of, of the Notre Dame burning down. Um, and and a oh, really right. different I valence. I forgot about that. Yeah, I mean, like the, the news footage just looked so similar, right? And so, like, I think a lot of my, like, thinking process, like, stems from um, these kinds of uh, more free associations. Um, but then, um, I mean, this kind of uh, associative thinking feels um, almost like uh, kind of like creative fate, right? Like, um, once once two things, like, um, are, are juxtaposed in my head, like, they feel inevitable in their union. So I was like, um, thinking about Notre Dame is what led me to thinking about Jeanne of Arc um, and, and the ways that it was the fire actually that, that made her a martyr. It was fire that like brought her to God um, just as like fire as a language for um, anger and a language for suffering and a language for loss um, is also a way to like interface with desire and like a closeness to, you know, what, whatever might be one's Passion, God. yeah. Right. Um, yeah, so that like I, I made a single channel film, which is what I actually proposed to the Sculpture Center 
initially, and that film sampled um, footage from Jeanne of Arc and um, The Bed of the Virgin, um, as well as included the entire uh, Zoom conversation between me and my mom where we're reading this poetry um and uh and then I'm leading us in a sort of reading discussion about it and I sp I picked those specific poems because they deal with um Ann Boyer is this white woman who's uh based in Kansas City and you know I used to live in Missouri and she's writing about rejecting um the carceral state she's writing about rejecting um the the uh obligations of um like thriving under capitalism under this ableist uh you know nonstop um sort of so so social formation um and you know she's also writing um as, as someone who who is white um about white supremacy you know um and hegemony and and so like there's this question also that I think uh is is in specifically this project about um you know who who can speak um about or to or for um whom else you know um at the time there was this big call um uh for people for non-black people right to address their families like to talk to your families like talk about like this their anti-blackness talk about racism talk about right like bring your folks in um and get them in line and um, this was sort of my uh, attempt to like sit with that and, and navigate that, you know, and, and approach my like politically centrist, you know, I mean, my mom is a pretty classic um, first generation Chinese immigrant, right? And, and her politics mm -hmm. follow as such. Um, and so the poems were a way for me to uh almost have like a side long access point into talking about what's happening in the protests and what's happening um you know with like different kinds of like inequity that were that covid and the pandemic were really like um uh sh uh shedding light on um and then uh so when I when I had the um I was invited to show at the sculpture center it's actually like the curator uh rejected or she asked me to change my proposal which originally was to show a single channel film and have a couple new sculptures like in front of the projection screen um and she was like i think you should just take this complicated hallway um and so you know it was an interesting challenge i had to reformat my um project entirely um and so then i was thinking about you know this long tunnel that i had to install in um actually makes uh your experience of the space like inherently time-based right you're, you're walking through it right um, so then i thought about like the the hallway the space itself as um the the time um the timeline of what was a single channel film and i wanted to like um dissect the constituent parts um of my you know video montage um, and make it this sort of uh, cinema that you could enter into um, and move through. Um, and so um, I don't even remember like how I ended up getting my, you know, thinking about wanting to use these rotating uh, motors for the projectors. But I think I was thinking about, about like planets um, and I'm actually using these uh, rotating projectors again in a show I'm installing right now. And, um, you know, I'm like thinking about planets as as bodies you know with this certain kind of right um analogy for you know like human bodies in relation or something um and uh yeah with um so could with i ask word, you i mean the, oh, sorry sure, yeah i'm oh, sorry i was just gonna you know I'm, I'm i imagine that some people are curious you know how like if we take this particular piece you know how this I mean, obviously, there's these these very political and very contemporary um, moments that are embedded in this whole work, as you you know really well articulated. I'm wondering though, you know, how the work ends up kind of in this space that is much more mystical and shamanic, and and obviously it's a translation of things because your work isn't didactic. 
but you know does the janus like how does that figure in symbolically in relation to some of these concerns well yeah thank you for i was uh kind of indirectly getting to that um okay so sorry my, my 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 main sort of like uh takeaway from from this like engagement with my mother and like thinking about this you know uh, political stuff is um you know landing in this place of um uh what is like unresolved and like cannot be resolved um right like uh finding a way to exist in this space of complication and um, almost like uh, ethical, moral um, ambiguity. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's that, that space of like ambiguity, ambivalence, liminality um, that I think like the hybridity and um, sort of like abject elements um, in the sculptural um, objects like really sort of either they speak to or you know that's kind of their driving force um you know Janice uh is interesting because uh he really is um the god of uh liminal spaces um uh spaces in between polar opposites so war and peace um summer and winter love and um hatred um etc and um so that's also you know um he is this uh, embodiment of things that cannot be resolved. And in fact, like his visage, right? Like the fact that he exists actually makes space for that in-between. Um, yeah. In betweenness. Oh, that totally makes sense. Should we play a little of the uh, video? I, I, oops, yeah. Um, and this is where I hope that, you know, it, it comes out. Oh, well, I don't know how much what you've got lined up here. Oh, just a couple minutes. Let's. It's, we didn't do this optimized. Can, so select optimize for video. Oh. All right, now it's playing. Yeah, that looks better. Okay. So, you know, I think that hopefully gives people, uh, uh, you know, a sense of the atmospheric quality of, of this installation um, in this, you know, incredibly interesting space. Um, okay, let me, oh, we're there. All right, awkward transition, but um, <laughs> probably a good idea that, you know, just for the sake of time, because there, you know, there's so much incredible work that Catalina has done. Um, this is a piece that what's interesting here for me, I mean, there's all sorts of things, but it's kind of two bodies of work. Conclusion and findings was um, a body of work that Catalina um, created after issuing an open call, inviting people to translate 
um, a legal document exonerating a rapist. Um, and she broke it down word by word, all of those responses, 40,000 words. And which is like, you know, an incredibly masochistic um, endeavor, right? And each word when it plays is punctuated by them slapping themselves. So I think that kind of, you know, at least on one level kind of carries through this this sort of this very dedicated but masochistic kind of um, undertaking. Um, and they the videos are embedded in these chaise lounges, these Victorian chaise lounges that have been kind of, you know, abstracted with cellu clay. And then you have another kind of reference to mythology to the Capitoline wolf, right? The she-wolf, the kind of legend of Rome and its its origins, this kind of patriarchal, you know, tale of empire. And in, in this kind of transformation, you've got a, a figure, which I don't know, you know, I took it as a self-portrait of sorts that's fanged and becomes this bench. You know, you see the kind of seats that have been built into it um, on which, you know, and it's called bitch bench, as, as it says here, to uh, engage with this text. Um, so... Maybe Catalina, you know, I'm, I'm interested in maybe having you talk about how you kind of bring together sometimes older works with, you know, newer works in the in, in kind of newer config these configurations and installations, which I think, you know, you're not the only one to do, but I think it's really intriguing. And, you know, maybe you want to talk about like how you're bringing them together in this particular exhibition. I um, actually made the bitch bench as um, part of uh, an earlier version um, of uh, of an installation of conclusion and findings. Um, oh, okay. And so, no mistake. Well, well, no. I mean, it it uh, that way. I thought it was um, an unsuccessful um, iteration of um, trying to physicalize um, the the translation project. Um, and so, you know, conclusion and findings is a, a text-based, right, like almost relational performative um, project that exists, like, uh, I mean, there's an online archive, but really, I think it lives in, like, email inboxes, and it, and it lives kind of, like, in, in the ether, and, like, in each interaction that I had with the 90-something um, people who wrote for the project, um, and uh, so I had another chance to... Um, try to translate right like all this language into um something that could be experienced physically which is you know i ended up with this um two-channel video um situation with the chaise lounges um and then i realized you know the bitch bench which did not work so well for the first iteration actually um will function really beautifully for this um the uh you know the alternating seating allows for this like uh do uh dual directional like experience of viewing um it's also a reference to um these things called gossip chairs which were popular in like you know uh around 1700s in europe how fascinating um, yeah um so they would have um seats next to each other in opposite directions um for like whispering <laughs> you know like whispering uh um, in in courtship also um whispers between lovers whispers between women and you know and thinking about um rape right and uh sexual violence right it's like gossip is this thing that is derided as, as um a trivial women's diversion um or the diversion of unintelligent people, but actually, you know, historically, just as with fires language, gossip is a mode of disseminating information for um, basically yeah. like the disempowered, right? Um, and it's a way of disseminating uh, specifically like warnings. Um, and uh, I think I'm remembering, I came to thinking about the, the she-wolf, the Capitoline wolf, um, because I was reading about Rhea Silvia, 
the human mother of Romulus and Remus. And she was, um, she was raped by Mars. Uh, and that's how she got pregnant with the, the twins who would go on to make Rome. And um, it was, uh, I forget if it's Aphrodite or one of the goddesses was like, so mad at um Rhea Silvia for being raped that they um were like we're gonna take away your children uh your children are gonna be killed so that's why they were sent to the woods where the she-wolf eventually found them oh and so there's this like you know it's like layered um this theme of like motherhood and and motherhood is this really like fraught like fucked up space right um and the she wolf, unbeknownst um, to her, right, is ends up um, helping these these two boys survive. And she she suckles an empire, an empire born out of like horrific violence, literally. Um, so that was kind of like my my impetus. And you know, I was like also thinking about um, you know like making a, a story that like bears the weight of its history, literally, you know, becomes like um, a, a, a seating infrastructure. Um, and yeah, I mean, you're correct. It, it's a self-portrait, you know, she she has my bangs, my very, <laughs> very recognizable, um, you know, ha haircut. And um, yeah, I mean, you know, I was like thinking about, right, like weight and um, the weight of, of carrying certain histories or um yeah kinds of um either violence or um disregard etc um, mm -hmm. and gossip right yeah. the weight of gossip too yeah yeah which as you say can be very subversive and and i you know i love the fact that that's you know where um the arrangement of the seating is, is coming from um i love that because honestly i did not notice that the seats were, you know, set up, but now that I'm looking, I can, I can see that. So that's pretty fascinating. Anything to maybe say on, on, you know, the fact that you, you literally, um, you know, I can't even imagine how much time you spent um, dissembling the text into these individual words. Um, it's a four hour loop if I, if I'm right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so that's yeah, eight hours of uh text because it's two, it's two videos. Um I so you know, part of my um my thought behind the, the translation project was, you know, the, the plea was like, help me understand, help me understand this document, this document that makes no sense. Um, you know, in some ways, right? Like uh a, it was a Title IX document. Uh, so drafted by an institution and it's designed not to make sense right because they're trying to justify <laughs> something that is uh inherently like ethically right like bankrupt um and it yeah. also is a document like specifically designed to create silence and terminate dialogue terminate conversation terminate gossip um you know there there's a non-disclosure agreement that I had to sign agree to which you know in doing this project I, I violated um, however you know something that uh, I heard from a lot of the writers for the project um, and also sort of um, received from their responses was that uh, there is no way to understand this document you know it's like hitting uh, a wall Right, like mm -hmm. it, it, it was just like a dead end, and um, yeah, it's like, so, like deliberately hermetic, you know. Exactly, exactly. So then I was like, well, how do I, how do I explode this document and and try to, to um, just yeah, like how can it be metabolized or transformed differently, and um, you know, turning it into a giant like word soup was like at the time I was reading. Kaja Silverman's book, um, Flash of My Flesh, where she talks about um, finitude, like mortality as a thing that like unites everyone. And, and she argues for analogy and, and this shared quality of, of us all like having an end. Um, she argues for that against the modernist project of an individuality and uniqueness. 
And mm -hmm. so, you know, I was also kind of thinking about, okay, like leveling the, the meaning of all the words in this project, you know, like reducing them into a kind of like primordial C and then seeing what different kind of um, almost like automatic or um, incidental meaning um, or feeling might arise from from this new giant concrete poem. Um, and the, the choice to then translate that document into um, this two channel video and make it really time based and sonic, um, you know, had to do with like, I ended up really thinking about the words um, in terms of like rhythm and sound and texture rather than their specific meaning. Um, and so when I was constructing like the new sentences, I really was thinking about, you know, them almost musically. Um, and so that for me was a way to like take, you know, this material born of uh, heinous and painful origin um, and, and just make it something completely different. I mean, you know, that's like one of the, the beauty, uh, beauties of abstraction, right? Um, it's kind of, uh, uh, totalizing like reinterpretation or transformation and um, you know sound is such a kind of um, like visceral almost erotic thing right and this like percussive loop that the video installation like falls into like becomes um, meditative and um, like immersive in in a very different way and that in itself was like a, a kind of like um resistance right on my part yeah because it, it makes yeah. me think again about like you know this sort of transcendence of logic and and morals and um you know the way in which language is can be fixed just you know and, and the way that images and identity can be fixed but then you can also kind of unmoor them and you know shape shift them into something else everything is kind of um malleable in a way um so that's you know just really interesting and i'm just gonna um show some more images so that people can see you know what the work looked like some details up close um and yeah there's sort of i mean there's this kind of grin you know this fanged grin i i don't know again whether or not you know there's a sense of of uh, a little bit of retribution that's you know being played out in, in that look of the figure or if, you know, in relationship to kind of dealing with this material, specifically this text and this experience, but also, you know, this kind of reference to Rome and, and empire and the fact that it is all crumbling and, you know, as a kind of parallel, you know, with kind of um the western world right is is kind of this country and and the time that you made it it seems like you know there's this dismantling going on um so i i don't know those are th sort of thoughts I, I don't know if it's really a question um i don't you know because I, I don't know whether it's as simple as you know looking at an expression as a kind of um you know slightly satisfied i don't know there's something slightly satisfied about the grin yeah i mean she her expression began as um something dazed you know um mm -hmm. and i mean i think like part of my my broader project is you know like defamiliarization disorientation um but you know i think there's also a quality of like elation the elation of like the fact of living right like the and 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 the fact that this is actually the translation project it, it was a mischievous project you know like mm -hmm. it was a way to take up the umbrella of art making and um expose this document right and it's like legally i'm not allowed to share it but now i will <laughs> to, right to, it's to like you found a way art. around it yeah, yeah. um and so there's that, but also, you know, I think there um, is this quality of uh, like resentment and this strange like psychological valences that happen with like um, resentment, bitterness, right? Like what does a bitter smile look like? Um, you know, I like think about uh, like disidentification 
um, in a way that like Minios talks about it um, somewhat indirectly, um, I'm thinking about it, but you know, it's like leaning into something that is either um, reducing you or um, dehumanizing you um, and, and taking power in, in like, uh, not embracing it, but like enveloping yourself around it so that you can like own it and thus mm -hmm. transform it. Yeah, you know, I think that's like satisfying. I think it's yeah. like a satisfied expression. Yeah, exactly. Let's play a little of this. Well, I'm again, hopefully. It, it you know I don't think anybody would know that that is the sound of you know you um, hitting yourself because it, it almost sounds like ping pong. <laughs> um, yes, a dialectic sport. Yeah. All right. Let me. Okay. So I threw this slide in. We you know I know we're, we we got to be mindful of time. Uh, I threw this in just because again I was thinking about the ways in which um, there are certain themes and you know obviously this. Uh, kind of made me think of, you know, what we just looked at, right? Um, I don't know whether or not this work is related to, you know, the, the Capitoline um, Wolf or it's really just a kind of, you know, multi-breasted uh, figure. But I threw it in there. Um, I, I don't know if you had any thoughts, no worries if not. Yeah, I mean, um, it's it's like a reference to the same creature, um, Captain Wolf. But um, I I wanted to, I mean, make make it weirder, you know, and and make it even even more syncretic, right? Um, I mean, I also frankly was like kind of losing my mind at the end of grad school, which is when I made this. Um, okay. But yeah, so I was I was reading a lot of um, specifically Chinese. Um, mythology, poetry, um, and history at the time, specifically around um, women writing in classical China. Um, and the interesting thing about the history of uh, women's literature is that it uh, predominantly was uh, produced by courtesans um, because uh, women who were uh, doing, would do, I mean, it, it's sort of erotic labor, but they were more like uh, court entertainers um, with an inherently like erotic bent, they were the only um, women who would get educated back then. So if you were like a noble woman, there was no need for you to have an education because you were just supposed to be a wife, you know. And so it was um, the courtesans, the dancers who who actually had the most um, nobility um, and, and freedom of expression. And often these courtesans would also be Taoist nuns. So, you know, there's right. this real that, um, deviation so from like a Western understanding of uh, rel religiosity and um, the erotic. Um, and so, you know, the forms of these uh, long story short, like is like thinking uh, that the, the stele, like the, the long um, monoliths are references to certain um, Chinese sculptures of like turtles from like origin uh, creation myths about like the turtle that holds up the world on its back and you know that is syncretically descended from um, Indian Hindu mythology um, and you know I was like really thinking about um, the ways that uh, these stories these oral histories and like folk tales like transform right and um, take on not only like new uh forms in terms of the the story itself but also like new applications in terms of like analogy um and yeah, so it's like this kind of circulation of of archetypes that you know move through time and and place and and yeah function differently but they still kind of hold a certain um 
similarity, right? Yeah, and, and so my um, uh, other analogy in that um, was to turn to uh, this phenomenon called shifting baseline system, uh, shifting baseline syndrome, um, which is a term borrowed from marine biology um, and it describes uh, the inability of contemporary scientists um, or researchers to determine the original um, population of a uh, species in a certain region. Um, and because there's no historical data about that, and so researchers actually have to turn to poetry and art um, from uh, historic time periods to try to piece together like, like oh, like what what did the population of this fish or of this dolphin or whatever it looked like? Um, and uh, they'll also do um, uh, take oral testimonies from, you know, like villagers or like whoever lives in the area. And so, you know, um, for me, like I'm very interested in uh, forms of knowledge that fall outside of, you know, what is like academically sanctioned. Um, and uh different ways of knowing heads. right no exactly and you know that looks like um oral uh history that looks like movement that looks like you know um interrelationality um yeah so so that in short yeah and it is interesting i mean i you know it's something also another thing that i really like about your work because i'm also very intrigued by you know other forms of knowing that are you know sort of outside of um you know enlightenment era positivist notions of you know science and truth and fact and you know in my opinion, you know, there's just many, many ancient cultures that already had the answers, you know, um, through different systems of knowing. Um, and I just wanted to draw attention to the audience, you know, to some of the text that um, Catalina was just talking about um, from a Taoist priestess and courtesan um, and a poet and a mus uh, musician. And, you know, this kind of bringing together these texts, um, Fish Mystery was a woman who trespassed wantonly in a phallic world of language and was perhaps thus executed for murder. Um, so, you know, there's all so much evocative associations. Um, I mean, there's a kind of subtext speaking of archetypes of femme fatales, um, you know, in some of this. But again, you know, the idea that it's, paradoxically, you know, courtesans and nuns, right? Uh, women who are living outside of conventional, um, accepted, you know, venerated um, forms of, of, of identity and, and being in terms of gender. And they're the ones that are really carrying so much knowledge and, um, imparting it and and who looked to it when it was written you know I wonder about that who was reading this um and you know as as you've talked about as well you know this idea too of like who's deemed you know worthy of listening to um and you know I don't know I, I just think that's all kind of interesting but for the sake of time uh oops what's going on here we'll move on so this was kind of what we started with a version of this and and speaking of kind of mythology right you've got this figure here i believe from uh chinese mythology a guardian spirit um who is sort of looking you know protecting the um the underworld and they're they've got a, a horse skull and they're leaning over a well with a pair of scissors that they are, you know, holding uh, to the eyes of this figure who's lying with their head, you know, positioned, uh, you know, in the well. So there's this kind of menacing, mythical, magical sort of scenario going on here. But then it's interesting, you know, to note that the, the piece is called Kant Waifu, and Waifu is an anime character, right? A fictional character who um, is often, you know, lusted after 
Um, you know, I think if I have that right, you know, so I think it's really the title again, your use of language. Yeah, it, it like it has, oh, sorry. It, no, well, you go ahead. Um, I was just gonna say it, it, waifu is like a root, is a word that has its roots in um, like anime, otaku culture. Otakus are like, I don't know, like Japanese incels or, or something. Um, and and so waifu is the sort of like, um, really like male gaze e um, orientalizing right. term um, to refer to like an ideal woman. Right. Right. So it's interesting that, you know, I, I just love that you bring those two terms together. It's kind of explosive, you know. Um, and, and of course, the scenario is fascinating. And this is at Lyle and King, the gallery that um, Catalina shows with here in New York. And we're going to look at some more images from this incredible show, um, which I think the whole title of the show was called White Male Ally. Um and anyway, I don't know if there's anything that you want to say about- Oh, I'm just about... going to um, jump in and- Yeah. yeah. So I've had, two, I've had two shows with Lyles and King. And so this um, this show is titled Cunt Waifu. Um, my subsequent show is titled uh, White Male Ally. Um, okay, apology. And um, the- Yeah, and the title for the um, sculpture itself is- this like long thing that I'll have to read, but um, it, it it the main title is otherwise despite, um, and then there's like a long thing in parentheses, but I refer to it as um, whores at the end of the world. Okay. Um, and uh, you know the the scene is actually based on uh, sorry the title um, in terms of its uh, like grammatic structure is um based on the title of the Duchamp piece um Les Antoine Donnet it was like his final work right um and it was like inspired by the Courbet painting the origin of the world um so there's this like uh female nude kind of lying in a landscape holding up a lantern um and you, you view the whole piece through like a people um and so I was like really thinking about these various um, historic references, you know, like the prone figure that's lying with the long pubic hair that's actually like cropped from the Courbet painting of uh, uh -huh. the origin of the world. Um, so I'm like thinking about like these representations of femininity and then also the ways that femininity is discursively structured um, and racialized um, so the scene itself of like figure getting stabbed at a well is um, cited from a political cartoon from early um, English occupation in India. And long story short, the British created um, a, a story about these like Indian thugs that were roaming through the countryside and terrorizing innocents. And they created the thug, that's where the word thug comes from, um, so that the English, the British Empire could save India from from these these bandits. Um, right, so it's like that, it's about that classic like how history colonial gets written. narrative. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Um, saving the place from its own barbaric, um, you know, indigenous constituents. Um, yeah, and and so, uh, I guess, yeah, I guess I'll just stop talking there. But yes. Yeah. <laughs> I, I did not realize that Corbet's origin of, of the world was there, but now I will never unsee it, right? Because it does have that foreshortening, <laughs> you know, of his work. And um, when I teach that work, you know, I always tell my students that it, it was, you know, a private commission for a Turkish diplomat who hung apparently, allegedly, uh, you know, a, a red velvet cover on, and would just sort of, you know, pull it back uh for you know whatever lucky guests um were, were given that visage so okay so so you're right now so that was the previous show and so this is white male ally right is it, yeah 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 and so here we're looking at um an installation called ego death which is from 
2021 recreating these just very common urinals, I think throughout the world, but you know, the squat uh, toilet, um, cause I remember, you know, seeing them in Paris. Um, but it becomes this kind of staging for these niche like um, environments with these very abstracted figures, but um, these sculptural vignettes, some of which I think have your fonts, which is an ongoing series where you're adapting in some case, cases, I think literally working with, um, you know, those kind of Catholic uh, fonts for, you know, where you dip the, your hands into the holy water. Um, and so that's kind of being alluded to, again, these kind of references to the ceremonial. Um, and there's so many other components that were part of this show that we'll look at. But um, I just think it's um, super interesting, this combination of these, these forms and this staging and you know this kind of reference to urinals. And maybe you wanna just share you know what you were thinking in adapting um that for this format um yeah where to start i mean i um one you know it's like water, water is primordial right and um like it was funny to put the holy water font on top of um bathroom toilet which You're is like a very different kind yeah. of vessel um for for bodily fluid right i mean it's like the holy water is supposed to be like the, the tears of christ or whatever it's like blessed by the body of christ um so there's you know um an aspect about like embodiment um and um i also you know it with the title um was thinking about um the kinds of like cognitive dissonance and like denials of let's say like hegemony so that would be like white supremacy or, or patriarchy and you know the title white male ally is specifically pointing to something that doesn't really exist i mean you know it's like it's a title whose logic is rooted in resentment and white male ally as a non-sequitur to my work um you know like a term that does not relate um mm -hmm. also like points to moron <laughs> no exactly or i mean or it's the greatest myth of all right um yeah but and it also it's like uh it relies on broken logic right like a non sequitur is a form of is a logical flaw where um you have to assume that something is already true or exists in order to prove that it is true or exists um so inherently like its foundation is ruptured um and with like the toilet you know i mean i had this like very vivid memory of using these things in in china as a kid and um you know it's like i always found that like white people in the u.s are like so afraid of poop um and like of what of poop like they're oh, poop. afraid okay. of like the scatological, you know, mm -hmm. it's like they're so like divorced from the the physical and material realities of like what bodies do and what the bodies produce. Um, and at the same time, they're like not horrified by um, the abject violations that are, are performed upon people who don't look like them, right? Um, mm. So there's this um, rift, right, in in what is shameful, what is fearful, what is repugnant, actually. Um, and I like yeah. the form of the trench toilet because it flushes at one end and then everybody down the line has to see like the whole river of fundament going past. I mean, it really is like this um, kind of like peeling back and, and it's so efficient, right? I mean, it's like modeled after the river earliest mode of transport um yeah uh yeah fascinating i yeah. did not know that you know um that that you know you would see it passing through it's really it's really interesting and i totally you know appreciate the kind of way in which you're thinking about what we consider disgusting around the body and then when you know as soon as we are truly like you know 
uh, with white privilege, right? You can just so quickly detach an other, and then suddenly it's it's all you know somehow acceptable. Um, with oh, I don't know why. Hold on one second. So so with this with you know here we're looking at some oops sorry some of these um, fonts which are you know taking different forms. Um, in, in you know because it's an ongoing series so this is font number seven and it's soapstone there's raw egg there's vinegar there's another trap an animal trap um beeswax all these super evocative you know sort of visceral bodily um and you know maybe even temporal kinds of materials and I'm wondering if there is a kind of ritualistic aspects to your use of them, or, you know, I'm sure there's people wondering, you know, well, why, why, what's, you know, what, why a raw egg or why white vinegar? Yeah, I mean, I, mean, I think guess, um, this, yeah, no, this piece might also be a good opportunity to tie into the two pieces that I have um, at the Kimball, just because yeah, we're, sure. we're at 6 p.m. or uh, whatever time it is there. Oh, okay, yeah. Um, but yeah. Do you um, want me to move forward? So, I mean, yeah, let's go to um, sure. the the pieces that I have in... Uh, just in FYI, I, you know, this is a great series that involves these puppy skull sort of fetal figures looking into a mirror with excerpts from um, um, Jean Reese's Wild Sargasso Sea and you know lots of kind of colonial context in, in those as well. And these are drawings, selfies sent to the artist um, by their rapist that um, were transformed into drawings and in, in this whole entire scenario where uh, this figure is stabbing um, a, a, an image of a sonogram. Video no longer exists, okay. Oh, I thought I fixed that. That's okay. Um, this is also, you know, from the White Male Ally show, as this is three betrayals. Um, I think your first foray into choreography, and it's sort of um, incorporating various things, reference to the biblical story of the dog and the mandrake. Um, I think there's references to um, um, quantum physics here, and also a story uh, your grandmother shared around her involvement in performing um, abortions. Um, and we did have some video from that, but we'll, for the sake of time, we have run out, but I think people could probably find some, some part of that. Yes. This is an accompanying sculpture to that installation, Three Betrayals, Scorn of God. And I think that's reference to the mandrake root, if I'm correct. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I'm then, I, I, I mean, I love this series of um, these drawings of the poet and Sexton, because, you know, of course, it, it evokes these ideas of credibility and, and crazy and in the way that they're often um, kind of entangled with um, women who are not, you know, easily uh, understood. Yeah. So here we are. So here we are with the works in the exhibition Wonderland. Yeah, thank you, Jane, um, for walking <laughs> us so cogently through. Um, that would have taken me much longer. Um, yeah, so in terms of material, um, I think, you know, at this point, I've really developed a sort of um, vocabulary of, and, and I love the word that you use, like suturing, right? Like it's um, just like various strategies that I can turn to, to um, put materials and objects together. Um, and so, you know, I think like one sort of overarching logic um, in everything I make and write um, from, you know, the sculptures to installations, uh, even videos is, um, it, it's a kind of collage approach, um, and obviously not literally like cut and paste collages, but um, everything is grounded 
um, most often in a kind of citation, um, as with, right, like the sculpture and kind of waifu, the, the big one. Um, and it, it just gives me like something to, to work from, right? And I think that's why I like to work negatively in terms of like carving into materials, carving wood carving stone there's stone in this carving foam um the the green part in the sculpture is made of um foam coated in plaster um and then also working with like found materials so the, the fabric um in this that is making up the pouch is uh like a woven leather um fragment that i was you know picked up from uh, the side of the road um, and then the the netted part is actually um, a dragnet that's used um, in fishing. And then um, the the kind of uh, a viscera looking like red part is actually um, a uh, white ribbed tank top, sometimes known as a wife beater um, that's coated in resin. Um, and you know, it's like and what's the appendage? Elements. Is that is that an actual kind of animal? That is a that's carved wood. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's a that's a piece of wood that I carved um, scales into. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, it's almost like putting together a poem, right? Um, and uh, really letting like the if not literal negative space, but the you know question marks like how what do these materials um or images like have to do with each other um like letting those question marks sit um right and and be activated in continually um different ways um so i think you know some of the like carving working with paper mache and you know i was trained in making from a tradition of almost like making stage props um so there's a lot of like uh, styrofoam with like um, paper mache and plaster and um, you know I make things almost like Robert Gover does right um, and uh, right sometimes it's hard to know what's fo a found object and what you've you know literally crafted to look like a ready-made exactly and you know I think there's an interest in like transformation and and a sort of like mastery of transformation and a kind of mastery and play with passing right like making things um pass for things that they're not um and those are things i take like a lot of just like visceral experiential pleasure um pleasure in um and you know with uh materials like the oyster shells or like the horse hair the beeswax um you know like those are direct references to animality and the animal as like as you like said very eloquently um kind of different kinds of analogies for unruliness or um the other um or or the thing that escapes um uh comprehension the thing that escapes easy communication right um and uh it also is um what was I going to say? Oh, like with materials like soft wood and plaster and beeswax, you know, those are traditionally used in um, votive objects uh, right. or ex votives. Um, and so, so, you know, I think my attraction to representational work is also rooted in a kind of like ancient historic devotional practice, right? Like it, yeah. uh, creating the image of something is a way of um administering or practicing a kind of fidelity to an ideal or to a desire mm -hmm. and also it's interesting note right that this piece of course as you you made mention to me you know is um related to doubting thomas that sort of biblical story where you know thomas presses into christ's wound probing um you know this uh, themes of faith and and credibility um are are being evoked here and the title the long version of the title is you know brings a lot of these different things we've been talking uh about into play you know the idea of of things falling apart you know, the apocalyptic the primordial um thinking if we have another image and this is this is uh doubt too and again, you know, for people to just take a quick look at um, at the text, 
And you were saying that, you know, the like hand digging into the mouth was um, clawing in, you know, was kind of alluding to that story. But I wondered if there was, you know, another subtext for that. Um, I mean, I'm looking at the knife going through the skull. Um, you know, there's something kind of um, more violent uh, about this kind of probing. Yeah, I mean, so um, in the both um, pieces have, you know, this moment of uh, a wound, an open wound being pried open by a hand that might belong to the same figure or might belong to a different body, right? It's, it's, it's left kind mm -hmm. of open. Um, and, you know, I kind of see both pieces as um, less so uh, like one figure and more like... Um, uh, condensed topographies or or something. So it's it's like uh, with this piece, the the head um, in this position of either suffering or ecstasy is set into like this mass, right? And I mean, it's like a globe. It, it's like a biomorphic flesh mass. It's like um, just an abstracted something else. Um, and that became right like a site where I could um, engage with these different materials, these material transformations. The um, kind of beige material um, that the hair is put over is lime plaster. And you know, I was oh. like thinking about that as a material with so much ancient building history, but it was also caustic. Um, and you know, lime uh, was something that was used in early like mass graves because it would dissolve exactly. flesh, it dissolves bodies. Um, so, you know, I mean, there's a kind of um, logic behind everything, but it's not a logic that I feel like needs to be um, immediately like elucidated, right? Um, the, I, I mean, I think there's inherently um, like, putting material together right it, it involves violence in its creation i mean with the bayonet that's coming out of this piece like you know there's a historic research reference where it's the same bayonet that was um uh it was first used in world war one and then the surplus of these bayonets were used to um suppress um riots in uh immigration det detention centers um out, outside of the Bay Area. Um, mm. So these are like the Chinese immigrants at Angel Island. And so, you know, it's like an object with a very specific, um, you know, uh, activation uh, in a very specific historical context, but then also, right, like registers in this more visceral, open, um, uh, expansive way. Yeah, no, which I think is what makes the work so powerful. And and it does have these ceremonial qualities. Um, you know, this, I, I'd read an interview you had done and something that kind of like, maybe we can end with this. Um, I don't know whether it's still resonant for you, but I, I was thinking about it when I was looking at this work and where you described yourself as a nihilistic aspirational healer. And I thought, I, I don't know why I really relate to that, but I do. And it it was something because I I could sort of describe my you know myself that way. It's an odd thing to put together, but it makes total sense to me. And I wondered you know whether or not you you still were you know whether that still had resonance because I know it was a few years ago that you you said that. Yeah, I mean a, a lot has changed in my life, and I have changed a lot. But yeah, I mean I think that holds true. Um, I mean, it, there is some, I don't know if it was like Nietzsche. I, I think it was Nietzsche, right? I, the father of nihilism. Um, right. I mean, his his argument really, which which I, I follow or agree with, is that in nihilism, you find the true optimism, right? Right. Because um, you have to really insist on your ability to, to make meaning, right? Um, and uh, I... And to be um, responsible for that. Exactly. You know? And to hold it and, and to try regardless, right? To try mm -hmm. in the face of annihilation um, without any like false um, hope or expectation that everything's going to be okay or that like inherently it matters and inherently you matter. Like you, none of these things is true. 
but being able to try and and also like care about others and you know try to minimize damage in the process like these are all very right like optimistic endeavors yeah um, in my view yeah and, I totally agree yeah all right so maybe um Nancy do you I, I uh maybe we should I stop share so that we could take questions and we can maybe see faces again Sure, I think that's a great plan. Um, I cannot yeah. see you, Nancy, just so you know. I'll join back in. There you are. <laughs> um, yeah, so I would love to invite um, anybody from the audience uh, to ask any questions that you have. Um, please feel free to either raise your hand or you can type in a question as well, either way. Um, but we would love to, to hear from you. And thank you both so much for... Um, for that conversation and taking us through your work um, and giving a, a, a deep- Well, I, I, I only wish, you know, I also want to like for, I mean, I, and we've got a small audience here, so I'll do this, you know, in another fashion, but, you know, Catalina has a show opening at Night Gallery, which is an incredible gallery in LA. And I wish so much that I could go and see it, but I, I really wish you well with that. I'm sure it's amazing. Thank you. Of course. I'm, I'm here right now, actually, at the gallery. So. Oh, you um, are. Yeah, everything, everything's okay. coming together. Yeah, yeah. Exciting. So, questions. I see one. Yeah. So, one question. Who are your contemporary influences, art or otherwise? So that's a large um, question, but maybe, maybe who, who, who are you thinking about right now? Um. So, I mean, you know, there's artists I like, and then there's artists I um, take influence from, and, and they don't always um, overlap. Um, you know, like Yang Vo is one of my favorite artists, but, you know, it's like I've never stri striven to make work like his. Um, you know, I think like, okay, contemporary. Um, po poetry is actually a big um, inspiration and, and, sort of like guiding format for me um it's like what I've um kind of poached the most like formal strategies um from so like uh Ariana Rhines is kind oh, of interesting I've you've been, been reading them huh? her work and um yeah uh her early work the cow actually and um you know, there's something, again, like women who are uh, difficult to um, exist with, right? Like there's a lot of that energy. And, um, you know, on a political level, it's like, okay, it's like really fraught um, territory um, for me, but um, there's such like uh, an energy of, you know, like I love the syncretic, right? I love stuff that references like across like time and, and, and place. Um, so, you know, she she's a one example. Um, I, I really love um, a poet named Robin Cost Lewis um, and the yeah. way that, you know, she interfaces with like the everyday, um, but also like history and, and art history yeah. um, and, and the archival or, or the archive um, art wise. God, I had Kathy Wilkes. Kathy Wilkes is like maybe my favorite um, living artist, which I think you might not immediately see that, but the ways that she uses also like surprising material which like it seems so straightforward but is actually like really um wonderfully and like uh, almost mystically transformed and and the ways that she activates um weight and light um in ways that become like integral parts of the work um for me are like on a formal level which you know i maybe didn't talk about too much today but um i, I really like uh, uh, informative yeah well those are some great um i think touchstones and yeah robin's a great I, I love robin's work as well um anybody else with questions oh we've got another one what is your favorite material to work with and which is your least favorite material to work with interesting um it really depends like I, I love um, like carving. Uh, I love carving stone. I love carving wood. I also hate it because it's so physically demanding um, and uh, time consuming. Um, 
I, some of the most rewarding work I've done is, you know, the, the choreographic video based stuff, um, making films, making video installations. And um, that's the kind of work I love looking at that I love experiencing as a viewer. Um, but the process of making it is always agonizing, right? Cause like, I can't just like tune out and like use my hands for like 20 hours. Um, <laughs> Every step of the way involved, and you know, writing is is a kind of agonizing process for me too. But it's but it's like infinitely rewarding. Mm hmm. Yeah. You know, it's interesting because we didn't get to it, but you know, you threw in some Balthus images, some Balthus paintings, and I don't know. You know, I just I was curious because obviously I I recognize that they were probably references to some of the work that you're doing now. But, um, you know, that's not a contemporary influence, but obviously it's a reference, right? Yeah, um, I mean, him and also to some extent Anne Sexton, you know, um, recently I've been interested in right, like this idea of like monstrosity, not just um, in like a purely representational or, you know, in the mythic sense, the literal monster, right? But it's like, okay, like, how does that express um, in people? And, you know, for me, it's really tied into this anxiety of influence and the anxiety of identification. You know, it's like, what does it mean to really identify with a monster, a, a predator, an abuser, a perpetrator, right? Like, um, I mean, it's not it's, it's so much a question of like separating the art from the artist. Like, I don't believe that can be done, but it is like, what aspects of your forebears, um, what aspects of your creative ancestors can you actually take and leave and, and critique and try to um, either transform or, or simply integrate, like learn how to live with them. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh, well, looks like we got a couple more and I know we'll want to close soon. Oh. Julie Pepito, how much do the concepts in your work come from the process of making it and materials? Um, and then there was also, can you say more about your drawing? So maybe you could talk about, you know, the relationship between, you know, how materials shape content and thinking and then um, separately drawing. Um. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll talk about that. drawing first because uh, uh, <laughs> um, I grew up drawing and um, I was, I uh, taught myself how to draw from making fan art. So, you know, it's only, that's also like a devotional practice. It's, it's like making an icon, literally, because I was drawing uh, celebrities and video characters. Um, so I think that's part of the reason that um, I don't do a lot of drawing and painting in my practice now, because um, like, you know, conceptual practice and, and sculpture and uh, more environmental work in the round, like ended up being more interesting to me to make. Um, but still, you know, the ability to, um, for the project of, of rendering something, of catching its likeness, you know, it's like, that's like an act of love for me. Um, and it, it's a process of study that is rooted in, in love and yearning um, and um, separation, right? It's like in trying to get close to this thing, but in trying to capture it, right? It actually like points out the, the limitation, the boundary in between like mm. you, you and the subject. I and mean, it's like any love affair. So draw, drawing is like, yeah, some kind of erotic exercise. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, I think um, my my mode of working, like my process is like pretty uh, like chaotic and um, in the sense that uh, it doesn't work any one way. So, you know, they're like recurring um, motifs or things that like I like to go back to. Um, like recently I've been thinking a lot about analogy in like quantum physics um, and uh, just uh, the ways that um, it's, it, it's a different way of understanding 
uh, time and, and history and, and relativity, right? Like um, it's, it's a way of throwing into question, as Jane mentioned, like these modernist assumptions about truth um, and uh, uh, like the index, right? Like neutrality um, in quantum physics, like th there is no neutral because everything is it's like uh, Einstein's theory of relativity, et cetera. Um, so, what am I trying to say? Yeah. Um, and also, not, I love the fact that, like, no, I was just thinking about how, you know, this idea that as soon as particles are, are studied, they, they, they perform differently, right? And just how that for me is a metaphor for just how when we try to apprehend something, like you were sort of suggesting with separation and distance, something, you know, shifts just in, in that. Um, process of trying to apprehend. Yeah, yeah, totally. Um, I think yeah, you just to close out my well. disorganized huh? thought. Um, okay, yeah. Do we have any any other questions? Yeah, just does anybody have any other questions? Because I know we've been at it for a while. <laughs> Any last questions, participants? I can't see who any of you are. So if you know me, ask something interesting. <laughs> one last one. Clock is ticking. Um, okay, all right. Nancy, take it away. Yeah, well, thank you both so much um, for your time and for really just um yeah taking us into your into your work in such a meaningful way um it was really um um yeah it was it's so interesting to hear more about the the ways that you work and um and the ideas and um that are kind of at the core of of your practice and um i really appreciate it thank you so much yeah yeah well, thank you both. Enjoy... and thank you jane so much this is like a lot of fun and they're not always this fun so... <laughs> well you know and i'm not feeling well but you know i i tried and and i you know i'm a huge fan so um i i hopefully you know we've just got you know more people involved in what you're doing and um, when you're back in new york we'll we'll meet up yeah I hope so okay have a great night, everyone. Okay. Thank you so much. And um, thank you. Thank you.